Peter Nash from the UK, where I work at our Open University, which is one of these distance learning establishments. It used to be called the University of the Air. It's nowadays more the University of the CD and the Internet, I think. Um, could you begin by telling us how you were first introduced to hypnosis? Yes, I can't remember too clearly, but um, as perhaps a young teenager or just before I must have found a book or two about it and found them intriguing and I remember eventually wanting to try this out and happened to try it on a friend who it turned out was susceptible and it worked very well and um, so I was intrigued and hooked and maintained an interest I've often thought that probably had I picked someone who was non-susceptible I would have thought oh there's nothing in this and forgotten the idea but then years later I became a psychologist and at the time I was doing my doctorate there was um, a note came round in one of the British psychology journals saying that people were thinking up thinking of setting up a hypnosis society in England there wasn't one at that time and asking for interested people to sign up and so I did. Could you share who were some of the mentors or influences that uh, you had? Well, um, I know what some of your questions are going to be, and they're all linked, really. Um, as I was saying, my early experience was merely reading one or two books about it and then just doing my own thing on a very occasional basis out of sheer interest. But um, once what became known as the BSECH, the British Society of Experimental and Clinical Hypnosis, once that was getting formed, then simultaneously I, I was learning hypnosis um, as it were, having mentors, if you like, um, from people who certainly knew a great deal more about it than I did at that time. Um, I can think back to um, a doctor who had the double-barreled name of Mayer Lochnan. There was David Waxman who wrote the book um, Hypnosis for Patients and Practitioners. I think that was the title, long since out of print now. Um, so those were the sort of people there at the foundation. There was... Um, a uh, British psychologist called Tony Gibson, whom some of your viewers may remember the name. Um, I think all these people are sadly dead now, but those are the people involved at that time. Could you share your own uh, understanding or definition of hypnosis? Yes, that's, that's difficult. It's hard to define, and it, it's certainly changed over the years, which might be of interest to you. Um, I guess in the early days, when I was reading about it and developing an idea, I would have assumed that although I probably wouldn't have had the term, my views would have been state-like, some sort of altered state of consciousness. Um, as I got into it, and at about the time I was getting into it, um, people were all being fiercely rational, and non-state um, ruled the day. And in those days, I guess I would be tending to write hypnosis in inverted commas. Um, and as for trance, I probably wouldn't want to use the word at all. Um, of late, um, certainly as a follow-up to my own research um, and in the environment we live now with um, all the stuff on brain mapping and so on, uh, I'm quite convinced that there is something different about it. Um, so I'm, I'm happy enough to use the term altered state of consciousness. And to develop that, if you'd like me to go on a little longer, um, I link it into to ordinary consciousness. I don't think you can say what, what is altered unless you know what it's altered from. And we are now very aware, especially if you um, look at syndromes like Balin syndrome and perceptual neglect, that the brain works very hard to produce a, a unified consciousness. And I suspect one of the reasons that we are conscious, which is quite a puzzle, um, you, most of our models of, of human functioning as derived by psychologists don't have a little box labeled consciousness. Um, you just have a stimulus come in and it's analyzed and that's it. Um, so somewhere consciousness is in there for a reason and it appears that one of its functions is to stitch all these results of the analyses together to produce a unified whole. And we know that if you take an extreme case like Balin's syndrome where people have damage to both parietal lobes, that they analyze material piecemeal. And uh, in one famous case, the poor patient said to the doctor, you know, wh when I see your spectacles, I can't see your face. Uh, whereas 
most of us um, fortunately don't have that problem. We have the opposite problem. We think we know all that's there and of course we, as a result, can suffer from change blindness and things can go on right in our field of view that we're oblivious to um, because we're constructing our own consciousness all the time based on fact but not a slave to it. I think hypnosis, where it changes, that is that given all this apparatus that enables us to build consciousness based on fact, it's very easy to start building it not too close, closely based on fact, based on background knowledge, memory, imagination, and we make ourselves a new consciousness. And I think that is probably a big part of what hypnosis is. Um, switching gears a little bit, uh, how long have you been a member of the International Hypnosis Society? Oh, a few days. <laughs> um, signing up for the conference, one becomes a member. I'm, I'm a member of, of our British one, but um, I wanted to attend this conference and automatically one becomes a member, so well, that's when. <laughs> um, you mentioned all this already, but are there other changes that you've noticed in hypnosis over the years when you have been looking at it? Yeah, as you say, I've, I've mentioned that um, swing of the pendulum sort of to and fro between state and non-state. Um, certainly I see the um, non-state people clinging on doggedly. They've done this in a way all the time. Uh, as um, the cognitive revolution took, took um, hold, they tried to rescue their position by calling it socio-cognitive, which to me is meaningless. I can tack socio on, on the front of anything. Um, any psychology takes place in a social context, but we don't have a socio um, physiological theory of vision or socio-cognitive um, explanation of reading, but clearly all these things are influenced by social factors. It, it, it was a nonsense, I think. So I'm glad to see that things are becoming more, more accepting of, of hypnosis being a little different. And I think that while um, the hard-nosed scientist and the man in the street were at opposite poles, because the man in the street tends to think that there's something in it, so much in it, he's nervous of it. A few are, are great skeptics. People tend to be polarized. I mean, if you want a joke on camera, there's the old story that you can divide people into two sorts, those that think you can divide people into two sorts and those that don't. And um, it's certainly the case with hypnosis, you can. But the majority of the general public think that hypnosis is a bit weird and wonderful. And it doesn't do any good if, if the harder nose research fraternity are busy saying, no, there's nothing there, there's nothing in it, um, when they can see that they just turn up yellow pages and there's hundreds of people offering their services using it. What we want is a scientific fraternity to embrace it and say, yes, of course there's something in it, um, don't be worried about it, it's safe if properly handled, um, this is how it's working, um, come and use it, make use of it. As we've been hearing at the conference, there are good uses for it. Um, I think the tide is turning. Um, for example, just this year in England, uh, we have a thing known as the British Association for the Advancement of Science, which is, as it were, the shop window for science to the general public in the UK. And everything is on display there. They'll invite people from space sciences, material sciences, um, latest advantage, advances in neurophysiology, anything can be there, and people giving lectures at a popular level. And this year, for the first time ever, they agreed to have um, psychologists presenting stuff on hypnosis. So we did a, a nice symposium on hypnosis for the general public. So I like to think that little by little, people are now going to be educated, and it's no longer going to seem as weird and mysterious. Do you have some predictions in the future for hypnosis? Well, I suspect that increasingly we'll have better understanding of precisely how it comes about and what's going on. And obviously the better we understand it, the better we can apply it. Uh, I suppose one of the many analogues of this that people will always cite about using things we don't understand is aspirin, which for years was employed without any knowledge of what it was doing. Now, of course, we've recognized unlooked for things such as its use for preventing clotting. Um, for strokes, heart attacks and so on. So um, I, I can look forward to a time when it becomes 
a first treatment of choice, not necessarily the treatment of choice, because sadly not everyone is terribly susceptible, but for those for whom it works, I, I can imagine um, people will look to that. A little costly in time, possibly, but very saving on drugs and all the side effects that they might be producing. Valley, do you have a favourite story about hypnosis that you share with us? Yeah, that's, as you tell me, everyone says, is a very tricky one because all sorts of things happen. One that comes to mind, I don't know if it's a favourite, but it comes to mind because it's one of those where it's so striking that it can work as well as it does. And I think people that do use it on others um, are still struck by it. It's probably a sad day when we're no longer struck by things and we're just bored. Perhaps we'd stop being good therapists if ever we reached that day. But anyway, this one was um, a lady who, if I remember rightly, had diabetes and um, therefore had had to have part of a foot amputated, gangrene setting. And um, she had what amounted to phantom limb pain, and it was a bit of a limb. And she'd been attending a pain clinic and they hadn't found anything that worked for her. And uh, she, she came along they said, well, you could try hypnosis, as so often happens. And one session just worked miraculously for her. She was obviously very susceptible. And the bit which um, I found interesting and may possibly have been the secret in this place, unwittingly, um, I, I don't know who was to be the audience for this, but um, th there is um, a, a theory going around um, dealing with phantom limb pain and a solution to go with it that um, suggests that the brain, as it were, has stored an image of how that amputated limb was at the time of the trauma. Um, for example, um, someone involved in a motorcycle crash um, who then loses an arm may have a pain that feels as if his, his fist is clenched, his fingers tightly gripping the, the handlebars and unable to let go and just cramp setting in. And with such a situation, you can set up a mirror to reflect the intact limb and it appears to be over in the position of the amputated limb. And the patient can sit there looking at their reflection and it looks as if it's, it's their missing hand. And they can flex the fingers of their whole hand and it looks as if the other one is flexing its fingers. And lo and behold, the pain goes. Now I wonder, my lady with the foot, I hadn't got this information to hand at the time about um, amputations and mirror boxes and so on. But I do know that she said that to relax by, she'd like to imagine herself by the sea. And I'd suggested to her that perhaps she was sitting on a rock and um, if her foot was painful, she could let it um, be in a rock pool and it would be soothing. And I have often wondered since, did she imagine herself dabbling her toes and wriggling them in the water? Um, toes, of course, are no longer there. And that movement, releasing the tension and letting things feel better. But anyway, she didn't want to come back after one session and the pain clinic started sending me lots of people, some of whom I could help, but some, sadly, I couldn't. Thank you very much for sharing your story. Thank you for taking some time with me today. My pleasure.